let's go ahead and get started. Um, so today we are going to talk about rebuilding and growing revenue during tough times and learning from businesses like yours. Um, so for a little bit of background, um, I'm Summer Parker Perry. I'm the customer advocacy manager at Zoho. And what that means is I work with our customers to make sure that they are getting everything that they want out of our software. And when they are helping to tell that story um, and make some of our case studies and customer success stories, as well as work with our customers for things like this, like webinars that may be helpful to other customers or to anyone that's really interested to learn. Um, but the real stars of the show today are uh, Carl Alexander and Lori McCabe. So I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves. Um, but a little bit of background there. Um, Carl Alexander is the marketing director for Crown Bees. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about their experience. And Lori McCabe is the co-founder of SMB Group and is going to talk to us a little bit about some surveys that some, they've run and some insight that they've had. So Lori, please feel free to take it away. Yeah, hi, thanks, Summer, and looking forward to talking to you and Carl and, and everybody, a lot of people on, on the call and meeting today. Um, so yeah, I mean, first let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Lori McCabe, and I'm one of the two co-founders at SMB Group. And we established SMB Group about 10 years ago after the quote-unquote Great Recession, which now looks like a cakewalk in comparison to COVID-19. Um, but so a little bit of experience in terms of getting something off the ground in not so great times. Uh, what we do at SMB Group is we focus on small and medium businesses, as the name implies, and what their business goals and challenges are, opportunities, things like that, and then how they may use technology, advisors, other things to help them achieve those goals. And over the last few months since March, we've been doing some surveys and studies to better understand what's the impact of COVID-19 on, on the small and medium businesses out there. And in March, we did our first study. It was what I call the deer in the headlights study. At that point, you know, it was basically, wow, we were all just kind of whacked on the side of the head with this, this huge type of issue that probably no, none of us in our lifetimes had ever faced before. And we knew everything was changing, but we didn't truly understand, I don't think most of us and probably a lot of us don't still, exactly how it would unfold. Um, and then we followed that up in July with another study, which we call uh, SMBs Navigating a Path Forward. That's mainly what we're going to talk about today. So this second study really looked at, okay, if you made it through to July, first of all, congratulations, and I'm assuming most of you have, so congratulations to you as well. But, you know, what have you been doing to kind of navigate through, through all these changes and all the uncertainty and volatility and what's working and what's not working and what kind of outlook do you have going forward? So... You know, that's what I'll be doing today during the webinar, kind of giving a macro picture of what we see a lot of the, the small and medium business respondents from our study, which was about mm, 750 people in North America. And, um, you know, hopefully you'll find it interesting to learn, oh, you know, is this similar to kind of the way what I've been facing or doing or people doing different things and what's working sometimes and what's not. Um, and then, you know, obviously my, my co-presenter, Carl at Crown Bees, he's going to be talking more about his own personal experience. So, you know, with that, I think we can turn it over and, and Carl can introduce himself. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Lori. Thanks, Summer. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's really exciting. <laughs> Uh, really exciting for me. I really love to share sort of our, our story and things that we've learned. Um, so again, my name is Carl Alexander. I'm the marketing director at Crown Bees. Um, Crown Bees is a small business that's been around a little over a decade um, based out of um, uh, Washington and uh, Washington State. And oh, there I am. And uh, uh, we sell solitary bees, um, bee houses and nesting materials to people all over the world. Um, uh, but particularly focusing on North America. Um, and so I'm here today to sort of give you a, a boots on the ground report 
um, from my perspective, from my point of view, um, and, and sort of share uh, what we've learned at Crown Bees um, and how it relates to all the really, really interesting information that Lori's found and hopefully um, share some of the things that we've learned uh, that we've done right and that we've done wrong um, uh, to all of you because I know that um, small, medium businesses all over the world are going through very similar challenges, but we all have to adapt and change a little differently. Um, and just a little bit of background on myself, uh, I've been in digital marketing for my entire career. Um, I've been with Crown Bees for a little over two and a half years. Um, and prior to that, I actually uh, spent a little bit of time or <laughs> quite a bit of time. I was living in Puerto Rico when Hurricane Maria hit. And so I spent several months on the disaster relief teams down there working with government agencies on how to pull together resources after a, a major disaster, um, get messaging across and communication across to, to really help the people of our island. So I think um, all of those uh, past little bits brought together here um, uh, really helped me when this pandemic sort of uh, came across and had our businesses. So again, thank you uh, for having me and thank you, Lori. Yeah, so, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, um, the purpose of the study was really to get a better grip on the current climate of what, what SMBs have been doing to kind of weather this storm. And it sounds like some of you have, have actually um, not maybe had that many challenges or your business hasn't been ne negatively affected, and that's great. But we do know that about, you know, in our survey, about 78% of businesses said, yes, we've had a ne negative impact. Now, it might not have always been revenues. It could have been supply chain issues. It could be um, personnel issues. It could be a lot of different things. But, you know, no question that, that even if it's maybe not that tough, it's a time of change. So I thought one of the more interesting things that we looked at is, okay, so everything is kind of, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of topsy-turvy environment right now. So who are SMBs looking to for guidance? And what came out of that question was the answer that, that the top, top group of people that um, most small and medium businesses are looking to are their own customers for guidance. And I take this as a great omen because I think that when you're, you know, right now and whenever you're in a time of change, but particularly with this change, you know, customer psychology, whether it's B2B, you know, business customers or consumers, how they buy, what they buy, when they buy, the way they want to buy, their, the way they want to experience service, all those things, the whole psychology around buying behavior is really changing. So I think that companies that tune in to the customer, and you may do that informally through conversations and, and phone calls and things like that, you may do it formally through surveys, but whatever way you're tapping into that, that is really critical in terms of helping you to, to figure out, well, what do I need to change? Well, how do I need to adapt? Or, you know, maybe there aren't any changes needed, but to learn, you know, what the customer wants that may be a little bit different than what you have been doing. And then the next group that really, you know, popped out here was the business advisors. You know, interestingly, there's a bunch of other advisors that also feature pretty prominently, financial advisors, industry organizations, tech advisors. I won't read through everything, but I think that these advisors really go hand in hand with the customers, right? Because once you get a better understanding of maybe what customers want from you and how that may be changing. A lot of times, you know, you say, okay, now I know what I need to do, but how do I actually execute on that? How do I implement that? How do I do that profitably? How do I do that in a way that my firm can digest the change? You know, it's um, the appetite sometimes exceeds the bandwidth to actually do stuff. So these advisors are also really key, and, and that's a very, very good omen as well. And, um, you know, I know that uh, Carl has definitely been listening to his customers. So kind of with that in mind, I'd like to get back to kind of how, you know, how what he's been doing to, um, uh, you know, 
to get his business oriented in a little bit of a different way. And you have to excuse me a second here because I'm trying to change the slide. Oh, I got it. I got it, Lori. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <No worries. laughs> um, so thanks. And, and you know, uh, as you're looking at these numbers on the screen, uh, uh, before I can even remark on that, I just have to say, like, um, looking to customers for guidance uh, was really one of the cornerstones of what helped us reach these numbers that you see here. Um, and also the fact that we are a, a very small and nimble team and we could react really quickly and, and our industry had sort of trained us to be uh, nimble uh, and, and able to react. So uh, when, when all of this hit, we as a company realized that we're not just a business that is uh, being impacted um, by this pandemic and by all this uncertainty. All of our customers are going through the exact same things in their personal and professional lives. All of our, um, our supply chains our distribution channels, everyone was being affected um, and uh, in ways that they hadn't uh, uh, been affected before. So we all needed to sort of find our own solutions. Um, so we focused more uh, initially on our, our company, really shoring up our team, shoring up our business, making sure that we're all healthy, making sure that our, um, our working, our day-to-day -day working practices were in, in place and were in a solid position so that we could listen to our customers and grow and change. Our, our business. Um, so uh, a little bit uh, uh, background on, on how we did that is, um, yeah, we were using Zoho One. You know, prior to the pandemic, um, we, uh, Crombies had adopted Zoho One for uh, many, many parts of our, 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 our business, mainly like for, for myself, uh, it was in productivity and marketing, right? So um, we used projects extensively um, of course, work drive um, to really uh, be be communicating with our team and and keeping our our, our projects on 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 schedule. Um, and of course, we were using campaigns um, for doing our newsletters. We've got almost forty thousand uh, customers on our newsletter uh, list, and we also have uh, close to thirty thousand social followers. So we use um, Zoho Social to communicate with them. Um, but those were all in place before the pandemic hit. Um, but then when it came, uh, the, the question was, okay, <laughs> can we use anything in this toolbox to really help us out? And we found, and, and I'll, I'll elaborate in a little bit, but we dug into the toolbox and we found that Zoho One already had a lot of the um, tools that we needed to implement the changes that we needed um, internally for, for our um, work at home uh, uh, applications, uh, Click, uh, Vault, and then of course all the, the sheet writer and show um, and I'll get into that a little bit more, but the point is we had a really good um, uh, foundation in Zoho One and because of the way that all those applications are integrated, it was, I wouldn't say easy, but it was a smooth uh, transition into where we needed to go moving forward. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to, to Lori. Carl, you're a lot better at switching these slides around than I am. So congratulations to you on that. You know, I think oh, that's really interesting what you said about having this integrated foundation because that can really help you a lot. In other words, if you have something like Zoho One where, um, you know, maybe you're using a certain number of the apps or so many apps, I mean, 40 something, probably not using all of them, but when things change, you you know, you can then say, oh, okay, well now I can add maybe this, this Zoho social, I may need to do more in social media, or I need to add um, something, uh, you know, I, I'm not using maybe the, the uh, meetings, but I wanna do virtual meetings and I can use that. So I think that virtual platform has been really a, a boon for customers that do have it. And- um, I have to say that, Zoho reached out to us and they were really helpful in saying, oh, well, have you tried this app? Have you tried that app? And then helping us integrate them. So, you know, it yeah. wasn't just ground zero and we had to figure it out ourselves. Right. And when you when you have these applications integrated, it just kind of streamlines everything every step of the way because you're not saying, oh, what do I have over here? And let's say MailChimp and then what's over here in, you know, my social app like Hootsuite and what's over here and something else. You know, you've got it all coming into a central place. So 
I think that 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 has been a big big help in adapting. Um, but just taking you know kind of a another step on um, and looking at you know the impact. So I'm sure you're all kind of interested in what's been going on. You know, and as I mentioned at the outset, about 78 percent do say they've they've had a, a negative impact, and that could really be anything. That could be a hit on revenues. You know, we read a lot early on about problems with supply chain, you know, getting people equipped and um, able to work easily from home, you know, social distancing requirements. It could be anything that kind of is, you know, kind of put a monkey wrench on the way you do things. Um, And, you know, in terms of revenues, as you can see on the right hand pie chart, a little over half of SMBs that we surveyed say that their their monthly revenues decreased, um, you know, from March to to July. So again, that's you know a pretty pretty big hit to take. Now it's not on this slide, but we do feel that a lot of SMBs are seeing kind of the light at the end of the tunnel, getting a little more optimistic because about a third of SMBs in this same survey said hey, we think our revenues are going to increase, right? Um, So starting to get back on track and about, um, you know, another third say they think they'll, you know, remain the same. So there are still some that are in the decline vote, but, you know, it it is starting to be be a better picture overall. And also pretty hearteningly, um, 60% uh of the companies or, or the people at these companies said hey we think we're much better prepared to handle things should another big um upset come you know should there be another spike and i i guess in certain areas and places you know we've kind of been intermittently spiking but you know we're all pretty adaptable and resilient in in small business and i think people are learning kind of okay, I can kind of take these punches and get up again and learning how to do that, which is, of course, great. Um, And, you know, one of the big things that we've seen is work from home, right? And work from home has been something, now you can't do it in all business, obviously, if you run a, if you're in a hospital setting or something like that, if you're on a police force, maybe, that's not something that you can really do virtually in most cases. But for companies that can um, implement a work from home and let employees work from home, a lot of them took this as, um, you know, a, a big lifesaver. And, you know, fortunately, as we'll see further on, many, many companies already had some kind of work from home in place. So they felt at least somewhat prepared to just kind of build on that. And I think that's been a really big boon to help people, um, you know, kind of cross this chasm into this, you know, brave new world that we're in. Now, interestingly, the work from home area has really almost become hmm, table stakes in our, our new world. And so when we ask people, well, what's been the most valuable, um, we asked them in March, work from home, working remotely, virtual work, that was the most valuable change they felt they'd made. But when we asked in July, we started seeing some new things popping up. And the things that in July people were rating most valuable is adding no touch or low touch payment and transaction options. So these could be you know, anything from, uh, you know, online point of sales, um, e-commerce, things like that, to virtual mem- uh, menus, which any of us that have gone out to eat, you know, we've gotten a QR code that we scan, the menu comes up. Um, all kinds of ways that you can, you know, replace things. Nobody wants to touch anything. So any way you can replace things, even on the shop floor, the factory floor, we've seen a lot of this. Um, you know, the second most helpful thing or valuable thing they've, they've been doing is, and I, and I noticed in one of the, in the chat, a few people had said this, you know, making anything virtual that we can. Anytime you can replace a physical service with a virtual one, that has really paid off. You know, we've all had our gyms do that. Maybe some of us have used telehealth appointments, but you know, virtual real estate tours, kind of the the list kind of goes on and on. 
And so I think that's another one that's been big. And then the digital sales and marketing, which a lot of that, of course, is the e-commerce and online, you know, making it people easy for people to engage and interact with you virtually and, and buy from you and shop with you virtually. So, you know, the good news, I think, is that these changes, um, not only are they going to pay off now, they're going to pay off down the road because a lot of these things were things people were kind of thinking of and planning to do anyway. Um, they realized there was, you know, an obvious one, an upside in e-commerce, an upside in no-touch payments, an upside in maybe offering more virtual service and maybe, you know, creating some subscription services, things like that. So the fact that we were all kind of rushed into doing more of this is a good thing because I think even as the world recovers, a lot of these things are, are going to be, for some customers, the preferred way of doing them. And they do offer a lot of efficiencies and, um, and can help your, your business make more money. So Carl, you want to talk a little bit um, more about that from the Crown Bees perspective? Uh, yeah, thanks, Lori. Thanks, Lori. Um, let me see, uh, forgive me here, I'm going to flip the slide back just once. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to say, um, you know, regarding this, um, you're right, the, when, when, when you're looking at how COVID has affected your business, positive or negative, um, not all businesses are looking at the bottom line, you know, the, the, the slide that introduced us. So we're not, we're not looking at just, you know, what, what our revenue is, but how has it affected our, our, our team, our customers, um, you know, our, uh, our distribution channels. Um, and so, yeah, th that's, that's a really negative thing. But like you were saying, it's a really great point is that it helped us identify a lot of the um, weak points, um, the, the, the stress areas um, in our, in our pra practices and our processes um, and really address them. And so I think, like you said, we're, I think in many ways we are a little bit stronger moving forward. Um, and, uh, Work from home preparedness. Uh, yes, I, I, you know, it's uh, that's a uh, uh, it's a relative sort of um, assessment because technically we were 100% prepared. We had Zoho One, <laughs> but uh, practically uh, we weren't. Uh, we we had been, uh, you know, for 10 years the the whole entire office is it's a small office, so we were just really used to working with each other. So it did take several weeks for us to um, sort of look at and adopt these um you know the solutions and the changes um and uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that in, in a minute but i also want to address the for us for our industry and i'm sure every industry has a different solution um but yes we added uh we have a store here in washington so we added curbside pickup um it was ad hoc <laughs> we had to figure it out as we went along um and it, it kind of still is but we are now implementing new changes in our e-commerce site to be able to uh to, <laughs> to do that uh, a little more smoothly um, creating virtual services. I'll get into that in a little bit as far as our webinars. Um, but, you know, we really recognize that uh, uh, people like to see us, people like to talk to us, you know, even though we have a small, just one store, um, people like to call all the time, people like to pass by and just chat, show us their bees. Um, so it was really important for us to sort of uh, uh, take a look at that and find a solution for it. Um, and then increased use of digital sales channels. I 100% uh, think that uh, any business, especially uh, an e-commerce business should really be looking into that. Um, for example, we, uh, just random, not randomly, but, you know, kind of putting out feelers, we started an, an affiliate program, which has turned out to be huge for us. We have a really strong, uh, virtual sales force that's creating sales for us that we just, um, that we don't have to put a whole lot of time and effort into. Um, so yes, for, for crown bees, we have, um, really done some of these top three changes and, and, and I think that's really helped us. Um, so, uh, specifically for us, our business uh, we are selling tiny little bees um, to people to have in their backyards and, and their orchards and gardens for pollination um, and it's not just we, we're selling them the bees we're selling them a, a bee raising experience because we you get cocoons um, and then the cocoons hatch and then you have to take care of them in their house um, and then after they're done working in your yard uh, then they uh, go back and lay their little eggs and then you're taking care of the cocoons over winter so we have relationships with our customers that last entire year. It's not just from that initial sale. Um, so we really recognize that, like I said earlier, our customers are going through the same uncertainty and the same 
turmoil in their lives that we were going through in our business. And we really wanted to reach out first and let them know, hey, we're still here. We're not going anywhere. And we're still here for you and your bees. Um, so our, our, we, we put a couple of ideas out. And, and you know, we really wanted to try this idea of a webinar where, um, as you can see in the, in the screenshot there, the owner of the company, Dave Hunter, um, put on a, a series of webinars on what is a, a solitary bee and recently how to harvest your cocoons, things like that. Um, so we uh, really uh, sort of embraced the, the Zoho One um, uh, 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 ecosystem there where we used uh, webinar, we used uh, surveys, we used campaigns and social among several others to really get the word out and, and um, prepare and have this presentation. And oh my gosh, it was so successful. We had no idea if anyone was going to show up. We had hundreds and hundreds of people show up, hundreds of questions uh, during the, the event. Um, and then we followed it up with uh, surveys afterwards and say, hey, what did you like? What did you think? And then a couple of open-ended questions like, hey, what's going on in your life? And, and, and what do you think about what's happening with crown bees? What do you think about what's happening with um, you know, bees and food security in your area? And we got so much wonderful feedback, not just on uh, uh, confirming assumptions that we had about what our customers needed, but more, um, more things that we hadn't even thought about, things that we didn't realize. Um, which, uh, as it says on there, it really helped spawn some new initiatives. Um, like I mentioned, the curbside pickup and coming soon, we're going to be doing a sort of like telehealth, uh, like you mentioned, Laurie, um, where people can, uh, during a certain period of, of time, just drop into a meeting online on our website and just have a live conversation with a, 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 a solitary bee expert. Um, show us images of, or, or video or just pictures of their um, what's happening in their yard, and then we can sort of help them out. So those are those all came from that first experiment, that first check in, or that first test. And so that's really what I want to um, get across is you're going to have to experiment. You know, you can listen, you can have ideas, um, but experiment and then make some changes. You know, we uh, after this webinar series, we we did another one that's currently running, and we changed a few things. Um, and I'm finding that some of them didn't work and, and some of them was because we moved away from Zoho and we tried something else with YouTube and we found that Zoho was way, way better. But you have to try those things and you have to uh, fail and, and, and learn. So those are, those are some of the things that we were doing as far as reaching out to our, to our customers. Um, so how do we listen to our customers? And, and this slide is really great in that, um, you know, I can say the survey, oh my gosh, is invaluable. We can make a survey, send it out to 30,000 people and get almost immediate feedback. Um, and how can I say, like Lori mentioned earlier, you can have an idea for a solution and start using it um, and your customers can start being happy, but maybe there's a change in, in another industry that sets your customer expectations slightly different from where you were going and you need to be able to react. For example, um, if you weren't doing curbside pickup and all of a sudden all of your competitors are doing curbside pickup, you would have to adapt and, and move that along. And, and we were getting that from our customers in our survey. Marketing Hub, uh, it's not really listening to our customers. Marketing Hub, we really use to sort of see how they're interacting with our site. We're, that's how we listen to our customers' actions, not, not so much their words. Um, support via desk and desk tickets, oh my gosh, yes, hands down. We consolidated all of our support channels or almost all of our support channels from about six different areas and uh, recently put them into a support portal and desk and that has increase productivity incredibly because, um, well, just the inherent uh, uh, idea of being able to manage tickets more effectively rather than emails and, and post-it notes and whatnot. Um, meetings uh, for webinars, like I mentioned, <laughs> nothing beats talking directly to the customer and hearing them in real time. Now, CRM is not really the way that, I, that our company listens to customers. We use that to sort of gauge our um, gauge the effectiveness of our communications and our, and our marketing and, uh, uh, campaigns. Um, through CRM, we can see uh, all the customers that answered a certain survey or um, opened a, a certain campaign or how many tickets they've, they've, uh, they've opened, as well as it's uh, linked with our Magento e-commerce site. So we can also see all of their order history, et cetera. So CRM is really our, our 360 vision of, of the customer. Um, and the one thing that's missing on here, oh my gosh, is uh, social. Zoho Social, at least for our industry and for our business, is key because 
you know, if customers are trying to reach you and trying to communicate with you the way that they're used to communicating, not the way that we want them or, or you know, that we would expect them to communicate. You know, no one just picks up the phone anymore. They're going to send a tweet. They're going to make a comment on Instagram. They're going to go to your Google shopping page. Um, so social helps bring all of those together um, in one window to help us really manage that. And that is, is, is almost a real-time uh, communication with our customers. So that has been key. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Lori again to sort of explain this next slide. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, you know, I, I really liked what you said about um, experimenting because, you know, clearly here in this survey that we did dealing with uncertainty and changing market conditions came out as the number one challenge that SMBs felt they're facing. And then that's in July, so that's a few months in. And I think it came up pretty strongly in the in the poll that um, Summer took at the beginning of this as well. The, the really interesting thing about this is we do a lot of surveys and we always have a question about top challenges and we have a list of standard answers and dealing with ongoing uncertainty, sustaining revenues, um, improving cash flow, improving productivity, those kinds of things are always in these surveys. And this is the first time that dealing with uncertainty and changing market conditions, the first time in 10 years, not only has that been the number one challenge, um, but that it's even broken into the top five. So, you know, it just kind of underscores the fact that, yeah, things are, are kind of constantly evolving. And so, as Carl said, you know, not being afraid to try something, tweak it, uh, you know, whether around the edges or just try something totally new it is often the, the path that's going to lead you to figure out what, you know, what can work better. I think one of the other interesting things that we found is some of the, uh, the responses that we did add in due to COVID were things like operating under new social distancing and safety requirements, reopening our business, pivoting our business. And as you can see, this operating under new requirements um, came out as number two. And, and so I think especially if you're in the brick and mortar area, uh, you know, or restaurant or uh, any, anything that depends on foot traffic, this has been a very, very daunting kind of challenge. And um, so some of these, these challenges are honestly challenges that, that small and medium businesses have never faced before. I, right, right, because the, the rules of the game are changing. At yeah, feet, right? absolutely. The rules of the, games are cha the game is changing, and this is a great time for companies to say, hey, you know, we we're always thinking about trying this or trying that, and a good time to try it. Because if you sit back, you know, you may kind of get beaten to the punch by, by a competitor who's a little more agile and, and willing to try something new. Um, and, and I think sometimes the other thing to think about is, you know, how can I implement this change, right? Um, and, and we're seeing that a lot of companies are, they've kind of always known, we know SMBs about 80 something percent think that they need to use technology effectively to, for the businesses to succeed. But I think now, and it's a really good thing, people are saying, well, where does technology fit into this? My top goal is, let's say, to attract new customers. So, you know, what, what's out there that I can use that's going to help me do that better? So really for a lot of these, these things on the list in this day and age, if you have any kind of business that you want to scale at all, um, it's probably going to be something that you're going to want to get some, some kind of business solution in place to, to help you do that. Um, so Carl, I know, you know, the remote work area has been a biggie for you in terms of the pivot. Um, we also saw that with our, our uh, respondents and a lot of people had something or they added stuff or whatever, but clearly this has been a big change that people have been making to 
help employees, you know, work productively in this this whole new world. So what's going on with Crown Bees and that? Well, uh, you're you're right, you know, and, and, and I think what we faced was very similar to what a lot of you out there um, faced was suddenly um, we couldn't be in the office. And like I said before, for, you know, for years, we've just been a little team, a little family, and we're used to just kind of bopping in and out of everyone's office into the desk and, and working things out with no sort of uh, um, official uh, communication protocol or anything like that. Um, so when this happened, um, it, it really kind of came on me and, and um, the other team leaders to uh, come up with, uh, not just to come up with a solution and make it work. It was more like, okay, come up with what are our real problems um, and then what tools do we have to make that work? Um, and so before we got into that, I, I really can't stress enough the importance of not just going down a list or talking to a business advisor that says do number one, two, three, is really talk to your team um, and say, okay, we're going to be working from home. Your communication is going to be limited. What's access, you know, what, what data access do you need? Um, what access to people do you need? Um, how can we set up a communication protocol that will not affect your your processes for manufacturing, for marketing, et cetera. So really sitting down with your team and finding out what their real problems are, not just your idea as the team leader, uh, what, what your idea of their problems are. That was super important. Um, and also working with them on, uh, uh, I met with each, each person and said, okay, this is what we're looking at doing. These are in all of Zoho, Zoho One, don't be intimidated. You're gonna be using this, this, and, and this. Um, so what we did was we uh, we got it down to um, uh, click was just integral to our communications. We all got it on our phones and our laptops, and we all uh, uh, could just pretty much click, you know hit click and start talking to um, one of our coworkers during business time um, at, at the touch of a button. So that that was solid. Um, also with uh, the video conferencing, just we could uh, use click to conference in the middle of working on a document. Work drive incredible we needed to have some sort of cloud sharing a lot of businesses um, have people working in you know different silos of information right marketing knows everything that's going on with our, our sales over here manufacturing thinks they know everything that's going on with uh, the products that they need over there um, but we really when we're not all in the same building um, we really need to be able to I needed to see oh does manufacturing have enough product to support this sale that we're going to be marketing over here um, so sharing that data and, and having everyone understand that we're all looking at the same documents, whether it's a spreadsheet or a Word document, was huge. Um, and then even when we were working on, when we did our first webinar, we did it remotely. <laughs> we were all sitting in our houses um, and coming up with this idea and then making it happen um, from home. And so uh, we used a show to create our presentation and we could all just be in the show at the same time working uh, uh, and dialing it in. Um, even a few hours right before the show. So uh, meeting with the team, coming up with a plan, enacting the plan, and then adjusting the plan as we're enacting it, right? You know, because we, we thought that, for example, um, we would use a one calendar solution, and that calendar solution wasn't driving with all of our other applications, so we kind of had to, you know, uh, shift and, and, and make that work. But through that several week process, we really kind of got a solid, a work from home experience set up for for our team and again we're a small team and so that that probably had a, a lot to do with it um, and also we the nature of our business we're very nimble and, and agile to begin with um, but remote work we uh, we I, we knew that we really had to have our team like I mentioned before our team had to be solid before we can look at our business and look at our customers because once we start if we were to address business problems and and we got them solved but then our team wasn't ready to actually run the business. Um, you know, that was just a backwards way to do it, I think. So we got the team sorted. Um, once we got that workflow down, once we got really comfortable with being able to use Click and all of our shared documents um, and meetings, um, we're ready to move beyond that. And I think a lot of you out there, are, are the, the dust is settling on this whole remote communication thing. Um, and a lot of people are finding it a positive thing. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't have to travel to the city to go meet with these guys. I can just press a button. You know, it's, we're saving a lot of uh, time and energy that way. Um, but what else are we doing? Like I mentioned, um, curbside pickup. That's, that's been huge. 
um, when we did these uh, webinars, we expanded our reach beyond our, our normal, our normal uh, customer base. Um, and recently with doing our, our webinars on YouTube, we've expanded even more to all of North America and, and across the world. Um, so we're, we're taking this feedback. We're seeing that there is interest for a lot of people out there to be able to communicate with us. Um, and so that's adjusting our communication style, right? Instead of just sending out newsletters, people really want to jump in and, and talk to us. So we're, a lot of our adjustments are in how we deal with our customers, how we provide customer service um, moving forward. And with that, I'm going to hand that off to Lori to talk about productivity. Yeah, um, you know, interestingly, I was surprised that so many people uh, in July felt that, yeah, work from home is, has had a, a great effect, uh, either higher or a bit higher effect on productivity or, or just neutral, right? Um, it was a little higher than I expected, quite honestly. Um, I do think, though, that, you know, initially all this meant for a lot of companies was video conferencing or Zooming. And right, right. You know, we have been getting into this whole fatigue with all of that. And one of the things I think is really important is thinking about the fact that you know, just like in your normal businesses, everybody's spending all their time in meetings and, you know, but not really able to get much done. That's not good. So you want to make sure that in addition to your meetings and video conferences and things like that, you have all the other things you need to collaborate effectively, you know, online file sharing and um, group chats and things like that. But you also have, um, you know, the basic productivity schools, the email calendar, of course, but you also have the the applications you need online so everybody can see, let, let's say, what's going on in financials on the same page, not like you're doing them in Excel spreadsheets, that kind of thing. So I think, you know, as, as we get more down the road with this, people are going to realize it's not just about the collaboration in meetings, it, it extends beyond that. And so that's important. The other thing that we don't talk that much about, but I think is critical is, you know, not overdoing it. You know, I know a lot of companies, they always now meetings are 25 minutes or 50 minutes if they're online. So people have a great time and they do fun things, uh, you know, maybe send everybody stuff to have, a, you know, cocktails at the end of the day and everybody can make the same Moscow mule or whatever or send everybody all the toppings for Sundays, or send them some cool coffee and, and let everybody have a, a nice coffee break and chat. So I think those things are gonna become more and more important too as you know as we go down the road. Um, now, Carl, I just wanted to also check with you and say, you know, looking at all of this, what what kind of is the most important advice that you have as a small business that's really been doing well for them going forward? You know, uh, I have to say from, from our point of view, what's really helped us um, and that I think a lot of people can, can take away from this is the importance of being uh, nimble and agile and like we said, experimenting and, and testing with uh, new ideas. Um, because if, if we approach our, our problems uh, as, well, these are the tools that we have to, to make this happen. So, you know, square peg, round hole it. Um, you know, that's, <laughs> that, that's not going to work in the long term. That might, that might work for what's in front of you right now. But every step you take leads to another step. And so when we were planning a lot of our transitions um, from process A to process B, we also thought about um, process C or that that would be affected. You know, you're, when you change things around, you're also going to have to change your resources. We have, as small businesses, limited resources and time and money and, and people. So you really have to think holistically, but experiment and change and be nimble. Um, and, and keep your eyes and ears open. Listening to your customers is so important because, like I mentioned before, you're going to come across opportunities or ideas that you hadn't even thought of. You know, for example, in our last webinars, we came across um, 
uh, a woman who is bringing mason bees or attempting to bring mason bees into local prisons to help teach prisoners um, how to raise mason bees, how to grow more food in their gardens, and basically uh, food justice. Um, uh, uh, and so we're going to be trying to partner with them. We found so many people, uh, 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 different community groups that are using our bees to um, grow food for community gardens that uh, they give to food banks and, and shelters. And so we're just finding all these different avenues and, and different ways that customers are using our products and services that we hadn't thought about that we can then um, channel our, our resources in and really help these people and, and give more bees for the prisoners and, and, and help people uh, uh, with ideas and, and bees for their community gardens. So be open-minded, be flexible, and, and really, really listen and find different ways to listen to them, to your customers. Because like I said, not every industry um, has customers that use social media or whatever, but find a way to communicate with them. I think that's super important. Well, that's really the perfect segue into the, the key takeaways that, that I have is, you know, what Carl just said, listen to the customers, figure out how what they want is changing. And, you know, the next is then you've got to execute on that. So, you know, figure out who who you can can turn to if you don't have all the the expertise you have you need in house. I think. Also, as we've both been saying the whole time, I don't know if we'll ever go back to the old normal. Um, so we really all do need to keep kind of trying to look ahead. The crystal ball is still fuzzy, but, you know, look ahead and, and think about, you know, if things continue in a certain direction, um, what does that mean for my business and, and what, will, what will I need to kind of be have on my radar and really tuned into and even though the the crystal ball is still hazy you know we've all talked about already some things that are definitely coming into focus and i don't think will change even when we're all covid free so you know focus on some of these as you go forward so that you're, you know, tapping into the things that are, all, are definitely going to be part of, of everything that happens from here on in. And just to kind of summarize those for you, you know, the flexible workspace, you know, work from home, it's going to expand beyond work from home. It's going to be a more flexible kind of hybrid arrangement. Some people will be in the office all the time. Some people work from home all the time. Some will have a combination. So think about what that means in terms of your office space, how you can have things set up. And of course, you need to get those solutions in place that make it easy for everybody to collaborate in real time, wherever they are, um, so that they can be engaged and productive. Um, you know, the no touch, low touch, uh, curbside pickup um, that Carl mentioned and, and some of the things I talked about, but we can see that's the number one, um, you know, change that people are making that they say, hey, there's a big payoff. Nobody's going to want to, you know, touch things they don't have to. So look at where you can replace kind of the, the, the highest touch stuff that you do a lot with some low or no touch systems. And then, um, you know, virtual services. Now, of course, you know, some things, if you're having a heart attack, you can't go into the hospital and be diagnosed, you know, over the phone kind of thing. But there, you know, telehealth proves and virtual gyms prove and virtual real estate tours. And, you know, we could kind of go on and on that these things became really widespread kind of overnight and they're providing a lot of value. So look, you know, to the customer, and in some cases, they let you as a business kind of start pursuing a whole new business model. I think Carl is is doing that with Crown Bees to a large exactly. extent, yep. you know. And you know, in some cases, this also opens the door for a lot of companies for a subscription service. I mean, just like Zoho, you know, you're a Zoho customer, and it's a monthly subscription. Maybe there are services you can provide that you can do on subscription that, or goods you might provide on subscription that would um, give you, a, you know, an annuity, an ongoing kind of revenue. And then the last one is um, cloud computing. And I know we didn't touch on this too much, but we, 
really think, and I notice a lot of you are thinking about, um, you know, spending a little more on, on your technology. What we've really found is, you know, overwhelmingly, companies have said cloud computing applications are really what's enabled me to get through this. So whether it's, you know, the Zoho One suite or, you know, there are other companies out there, but basically businesses say we could never have done this without cloud computing. You know, we couldn't have bought services, servers rather, put them in our offices. No, nobody was even coming into the offices, let alone we didn't have any, you know, any expertise to get them set up and running. So I would say, you know, if you are still running some applications internally, now is maybe a good time to think, okay, maybe I move some of that to the cloud if you haven't already. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Summer and um, she'll turn it over to questions. And thank you all for, for attending. For now, I just wanted to give a big thank you to Lori and Carl. Thank you so much for running through all of this. And thank you to all of you for joining. I think this is a great session and we really enjoyed having you. Uh, um, we have a couple really questions. Fun. It was great. Good, good. Um, and folks, want another webinar? We'll absolutely do our best. Um, I think Carl and Lori both have some awesome information. So hopefully we'll bring more to you soon. And for now, we'll go ahead and say goodbye. And thank you all. We'll see you next time.